Uh, Kwame Jantua is Energy, a lawyer and CEO of Africa Energy Consortium Limited. Uh, Ajua Dobia Owusu is investigative journalist at Ford Estate. Uh, thank you, Ajua, for joining us. Uh, also, John Jinapo is a ranking member on the Mines Energy Committee in Parliament. And Ajua, I want to start with you. Uh, today, you've sent a petition to the OSP. Tell us about it. Hello, Evans. I can hear you, yes. Yes. So the petition that we sent to the Office of the Special Prosecutor, we are basically asking for the Special Prosecutor to investigate the issue and after investigation also ensure that the individuals that are involved in this, they are prosecuted and it shouldn't just end there. We must also retrieve our monies. So the monies must also be retrieved for us. There's a lot of money involved and 100 million is a lot of money that we shouldn't let go. Already they've paid so much to them, 100 million Ghana cities. And if they are going to get a new contract and they are going to be paid $100 million, then it means that there is a lot more that needs to be done. We don't need to let all the monies that are being paid. If they say that they have been able to save the country a lot of revenue, then it means that the little that revenue that we've been able to get should not also go waste. So that is all that we are asking the special prosecutor to do, to investigate and ensure that our monies are retrieved and the individuals are prosecuted. Uh, Kwame. Is that a good move? Evans, when I, I heard this particular issue, the first question I asked myself... Uh, we, have a, we, have, we have a slight challenge with the quality of your, of your audio. I don't know if you are, it's because of what you're speaking into, but let's try again. Let's see if we can hear you. I can hear you, but it's, just, it's, it's a bit difficult to quite... Can you, can you hear me now? It is great, yes. It's perfect now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. So what I was saying... When I heard, I listened to this particular um, issue today on, the, on your channel, Joy, I asked myself the, the, the question. Audio, the audio has, has gone bad again. I don't know if the positioning, because when you started speaking, so me, it was perfect. Um, let's, let's try again. Is it better now? It is perfect. It stay there or, or speak directly into the microphone okay. you're using, because this is perfect. Okay. So I'm saying that when I heard, listened to your take on it today on joy. The first question I asked myself was, before the Minister of Finance and the GRA decided to bring SFM in, did they go to MPA? Did they go to GRA? And additionally, did they go to POST to find out what the challenges were and whether such a company coming in was worth it? Did they ask whether MPA had the wherewithal to be able to track these losses before bringing the company. That, I do not know whether it happened. Because if you're going to bring such a company in to do the kind of job they want them to do, you need to find out whether the job is being done by the institutions that govern the, the, the petroleum sector. And even when you look at losses, losses in the downstream petroleum sector has got to do with OMC taxes, uh, them not paying taxes. And then the other bit is whereby products that are made for West Africa are being sold within the country. Okay, uh, uh, Kwame, Kwame, apologies there. We, we just can't hear uh, what you're saying. And I know you're making great inputs. It's it just about the audio uh, quality. Well, let's, let's try and fix that. My director will get onto the line right now uh, and help you fix it so we can, once we get you back, uh, we can hear you uh, properly. And let me bring in um, uh, Mr. Junapo, who is joining me tonight. Mr. Junapo, so the OSP now has been triggered um, with, the, with the petition to them. Uh, is that a move that you back? Because I know you also had highlighted your own demand for Parliament to look into this. Would you back the OSP call whilst you suspend your parliamentary uh, inquiry, or you want both to proceed at the same time? Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, the petition to the OSP is specific. And it borders on, in my opinion, two main areas. I think that Parliament can look at it from a policy point of view. The first question I ask myself is, is it a duty of the Ministry of Finance to go sign inside contract? Because the core mandate of the Ghana Revenue Authority is to assure that there is tax compliance, raise tax revenue, and if as the ministry believes, there are some leakages in terms of revenue assurance. For me, it falls squarely within the ambience of the Ghana Revenue Authority. 
the ministry ought to be making policy and ensuring that it gives policy direction. If the ministry wants to go down there and begin to sign contracts for quality assurance, tax compliance, and revenue mobilization, then the key question is that what is the duty of the GRE? But the GRE is an agency under the, under the ministries, you know? Yes, that's true. That's true. And so normally, you would have the GRE asking for such support. The GRE engaging companies to help the GRE in fulfilling its mandate. The ministry would generally give general policy directive. For instance, if the ministry wants e levy the ministry will come to parliament and get approval for e levy But when it comes to the implementation, in terms of the collection, depositing the money, and accounting for that money, it is the core duty of the GRE. And so those are the issues that I think we ought to be looking at as a country. Whether, first of all, the ministry must even be getting involved in some of these contractual obligations. But more importantly, it does appear, and from my personal checks, that the GRA and the NPA, a lot of the senior staff are oblivious of what this particular company is doing. And most of them are not happy with what this company is doing. The NPA, for instance, we visited the NPA a couple of weeks ago, and the NPA made it clear that they had the capacity, they had the technical know-how, they had the infrastructure, and they had the technological know-how to ensure that there's revenue assurance. And that through their systems, they've even hooked up with ICOMS, Customs, GRA for that matter. And that, as far as they are concerned, their system is robust enough working in collaboration with GRA to ensure that whatever leakages that potentially can surface are addressed. And so you ask yourself, do you even need this company in the first instance? All they are doing is adding to the layer, pardon contracts, increasing cost to the state, because don't forget the key element of taxation and revenue collection is efficiency. If you spend one CD, in collecting, say, 0.5 CD, or you spend two CD to collect one CD, in taxation, that is not efficient at all. Unless there's a specific reason for doing so, there will be no need spending so much to collect so little. And it's also turned out that those so-called savings they claim to have made were bogus. And that is one of the problems I think Parliament should be looking at, with and without, in terms of treatment. We keep hearing so many figures. We've saved this amount. We've created this number of jobs without looking at the real impact of the program. So, for instance, if you have factories creating, say, 10,000 jobs and you initiated a project, what you ask yourself is that without the project, how many jobs would the factories have created? And now with the project, how many jobs? And so people keep bundling and throwing about figures. And let me commend Manasseh and his team the fourth estate, they've done a very, very good job. Uh, immediately, we, we push and we, we strongly believe that this contract should be suspended. For me, it adds no value. It brings nothing to the table except additional cost to the state. And that all these issues should be reviewed. I'm picking information that is not just a GRA. I've just picked information that ECG is on the radar. I've picked information that the Energy Commission is on the radar and that the Ministry of Finance is pushing for such unnecessary so-called revenue assurance, which only ends up leading to huge cost burden to the states. I mean, but Mr. Junapo, you're on the Finance Committee also. If you look at the current arrangement we have with the IMF, part of that IMF program requires that we, we do great work in expanding our revenue base. Um, and if we are not imposing fresh taxes, we must find a way of being more efficient in tax collection. Isn't it why this is necessary? I mean, if, you're, if your intelligence is correct, uh, ECG, you know, you've criticized ECG for its failure to you know, collect what people actually, they, for the power that we all consume. Isn't this why this is necessary, especially at this time when we need to ensure that we are not leaking revenue that should come to the state? And that's why these I guess, revenue assurance interventions are necessary. And you have to create redundancies to ensure that you, know, you get what you're due, the state is due. 
That is the reason why we don't need this. In fact, this goes to the core and, and it confirms our problem that you don't need this. Because firstly, the so-called savings they claim to have made is turned out to be false. So therefore, those savings are not true. Secondly, you only bring external support when internally you cannot deal with the situation. If you have internal capacity and your internal capacity can address a challenge, you do not go outsourcing because outsourcing comes at a cost. And as I was saying, when we went to MPA, MPA made it clear that they had already initiated systems specifically for volume tracking. They had installed systems specifically for volume tracking. MPA has had an enterprise relation database system. It is called the ERDMS, which is linked with OMCs and BDCs. And so they are able to tell in real time the volumes coming out from the BDCs to the OMCs. And that no transaction from the depots can go out or on illegally unless it goes through the ER DMS. And they hook that system with the GRA through ICOMS Customs. And so clearly, there is no need for this. If MPA did not have that capacity, if they lack the capacity, if they had a challenge, and internally they couldn't address this situation, then you would think of bringing this company. But from all intents and purposes, it's clear that this company doesn't even have the capacity. So even if you wanted a superior technology, you wanted a company that is experienced, a company that has the technical know-how, and a company that will bring about efficiency. But what we are seeing, and you see, one of the things we also ought to be asking is that, how was the procurement done? Was it through a competitive basis? Was there baseline information? Did they do some initial assessment? How was that assessed? And how did uh, public procurement authority even approve such transactions? These go to the core of governance and the unnecessary cost burden to the taxpayer. I hold the view that having engaged with NPA and having engaged with GRA, this contract is absolutely unnecessary. It is needless. It's a drain on the taxpayer, a drain on the budget, and ought not to have been signed in the first instance. Mm. There's a window of opportunity. It should be suspended. Uh, and now Don't wanna, move forward with this. Uh, and you asked a question I want to put to Adobe. Adobe, what did you establish when it, it came down to how this company got the contract? Was it competitive bidding? Relevance, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would want to make reference to something that uh, Napo said earlier. He talked about the measures that were put in place. One, uh, you are asking about which contract. It was a sole sourcing contract. But then we all know that even with sole sourcing, the organization is supposed to, or the company that is being given the contract is supposed to be able to prove that it has enough experience to be able to undertake the projects that it is being contracted to do. Here is a case that this particular company is an offshoot of a timber company that had no revenue assurance experience, yet it was given that contract. I don't know what due diligence that um, the procurement authority did, yet it gave them the contract. After the contract had been given, was there any monitoring or evaluation done? If there was none, why are they now giving this same organization another contract? When he was speaking, he talked about the ERDMS, which is the Enterprise Relational Database Management System. This is something that MPA has already set up to be able to curb these revenue losses that we are experiencing. Mm -hmm. If this measure and other measures by the MPA and the GRA has been set up, then what do we even need another organization for? And this is to answer the question that you asked about, isn't it necessary that we find different means of getting more revenue because of the IMF conditionalities? I think that we already have the people in place who are being paid by taxpayers' money and they are supposed to work to deserve the money that they are getting monthly. But if we have all these people there and they do nothing, virtually nothing, and yet we have to pay more money to another private company because of probably somebody's interest just to be able to do these things. At the end of the day, in our investigations, we realize that even the claims that this same company is saying that 
they have been able to keep. They said that, well, they kept uh, dilution, they kept under declaration, they kept diversion. Are these things true? They haven't been able to prove. They said, no, they don't. And this is from the horse's own mouth. It is not from us. They told us they don't do any of these things. Secondly, they had it on their websites that they have been able to save the country one billion in one year and also been able to save the country three billion in three years. That is from 2020 till now. First of all, the question is, the one billion from which month to which month? In our investigations, we realized that it was even 10 months. And if it is 10 months, then per their own calculation, it should even be 800,000, 800 million, and not the one billion that they claim they have been able to save. That they couldn't give us an answer to that. Now you are saying that you've been able to save the country three billion. We come to you and we ask you, is it true that you've been able to save the country three billion? And you tell us that you don't know about it. It is the media that reported it. And you even prompted the media that they have made a mistake. Yet this same information is on your website. Now the question I am asking myself is, if we have an, a company that is not able to manage its own website to be able to determine even what contents to put on their website, then how can that organization be able to help save a whole country revenue? I think that's a question that we should be asking ourselves. It means that the country first, uh, the company first of all, is not even fit to be able to give to be able to uh, do the contracts that it has been given. It is mm. not fit to play that role. Mm. It has no experience and does not deserve the contract that it has been given and does not also deserve to be able to extend that contract to get the new, uh, the additional money that it is going to get. Uh, and, and, and Kwame is back with us. Kwame, you were asking a few of your own questions when you first watched this. Yes, I asked myself before um, S SML was, was was put in place, did government, the Minister of Finance, go to MPA, go to BOST, go to GRA to find out whether they had problems with leakages? And if they did, what were they doing about it? And what could government do to help them? But it wasn't so. Look, the ARDMS system was installed in 2018, a year before SML was, was brought in. So what was the reason for them coming in? And look, where you get MPA, MPA today can track any truck, any tanker from loading at the, uh, at, the, at the port right through to its end point. And if the truck stops anywhere, they can tell. And within the payment structure of petroleum products where the BRVs are concerned, they are able to deduct from the, the, the payment for, to these BRVs, the losses. And I can show you a list of a lot of these things that MP has done. So you ask the question, what were they there for? Why did they bring them in? What was the re reason for? If the amounts of money they say they pay them, pay them a month, 24 million. Up to 24 million. Up to 24 million every month. Then we don't need to go to IMF. If we have that kind of money in the country, we don't need to go to IMF. That's about 288 million a year. It's a lot of money, series, a year. So really and truly, we need to look at it. And the question is, is it the OSP or is it parliament? I, I, I hope there would be probably a mix of parliament, stakeholders, CSOs, to look into this particular issue. Because if OSP does not have the money to do a lot of these uh, prosecutions, then it's going to go into what? 2024, 2025, 2026, when we will finally find something being done. So if Parliament, bringing in the CSOs, can sit and look into it and give us results quickly, it would help. Yeah, but, but, yes. But you, yes. you, you, you raised you raise a question earlier about the work that the MPA is doing and the MPA's own structure to revenue assure and to track the, I mean, the, the, the movement of, of petroleum products. Is it the case that the MPA system, yes, has been set up, but has it been effective? And what's to prove that they actually saved us revenue? I mean, you get the sense that government did not really quite 
was satisfied with that arrangement and so they needed another entity to sort of put in there redundancy um, in addition to what the MPA was doing. Is the evidence that the MPA work had been effective, for example? The MPA work is very effective. Ask those who have um, BRVs and ask how they're, they're sanctioned. Most importantly, yeah, especially those petroleum products that are supposed to be taken outside the country to our neighboring uh, country, countries that uh, surround us. Those petroleum products that go out aren't taxed. When those petroleum products aren't taken out and are sold within, that's where government loses money. And MPA has been able to track it. So because of the tracking, nowadays you don't get too much for certain things happening. And the taxes, government has increased petroleum taxes twice. Even uh, with, 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 with this, they have also been able to track some of these BRBs who are doing uh, some of these things. So you ask yourself the question, why SML? If there isn't some ulterior motive behind it, wouldn't you have thought the Minister of Finance would speak with the Minister of Energy to find out what the situation is? Because if that happened, they'll be talking about it today. That yes, the Minister of Energy was aware of this, Minister of Energy sanctioned it, Minister of Energy was able to tell the differences in, 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 in tax regimes that government was losing and all that. We haven't heard anything. Mm. They've gone silent. And I hope and pray that the president is watching this. It will come up in cabinet and the necessary things will be done. The questions will be asked to the Minister of Finance because he has renewed the contract of SM, SML. Why has he renewed it if they themselves are telling us? In fact, it's, they, not, it's not a renewal. <laughs> it's an expansion. And, and I, want to, I want to go there next because I want to bring in Jinnah. Mr. Jinnah, this expansion um, that would give the private company $100 million revenue, I mean, $100 million uh, a, over, that, over that period of time, it is supposed to re do revenue assurance, but in the upstream, um, in the upstream oil and gas sector, and then they will get their uh, 75 cents for the barrel that we produce. And then if we come to the, um, the mining sector, the gold mining sector, they will get the 0.75% of, of the total uh, gold that we produce. First tell me, you, you, you were a deputy minister once. In the upstream sector, combined with the gold mining sector, do we not already have in place mechanisms to check what the uh, the EMP companies and the mining companies declare that they are producing so we can um, uh, be, be, be assured that we are taxing them right and, and getting what we require from them? Is there a system in place like that already? Or is it not? Absolutely. There are systems in place. Secondly, these companies, when they sell oil, everything is posted on their uh, website and stock market. But, but are we trusting we the flow, companies or we are independently verified? We have flow meters. We have flow meters. We have GRE officials always on board. And in these days, technology would allow you to communicate in real time. I'll just read something to you. I need to give you, I wouldn't disclose my source, but yeah. when I read to you, you would get to know where it's coming from. Just one moment. At the filling station pumps, NPA has established a national fuel monitoring system. Automatic tank gate probes are inserted in the underground storage tanks to measure volumes and as well detect water in the tanks. All these three systems above provide real-time monitoring data and MPA is in the process of completing a looping system so that all three systems speak to each other and help reconcile volumes and numbers. OMCs have also access to the automatic gauge tank system dashboards to see volume movements in real time from their stations. PMMS, we use PMMS now as a quality monitoring and assurance system. The doping to some extent also helps us track the volumes. In addition to these existing systems, almost all the private depots have installed their own ATGs in their tanks so they themselves can monitor stock. The most efficient way for government was not to invest in these contracts, 
but to set up a monitoring tool in-house, provide the standards, and ask all depot and filling station owners operators to plug in and provide real-time information to GR. So you can see that there's a comprehensive way of handling this. And you see, there are four main procurement methods. You have a competitive tender, you have restrictive tender, you have single sourcing, and single sourcing means you have different, different companies that can provide the same service, but maybe because of emergency, you go for one. But more importantly, you have sole sourcing. Sole sourcing is when that is the only company that has the capacity and the technical know-how. This company clearly doesn't have that capacity and technical know-how. So even in terms of the procurement, I'm foreseeing that there are real breaches with the procurement itself. And now, as if that is not enough, they are extending it to our oil. Look, you look at the volume of oil we produce every day, close to 200,000. And you see, in the oil sector, even five cents, five cents, is a lot of money because when you multiply that by the volumes, and you know your revenue is a function of the price than the volumes, somebody is making so much money on the back of the sweat of Ghanaians. Look, this contract. Is a nemical. This contract must not stand. And people with conscience, people who love this country, irrespective of their political affiliation, must speak out against this contract. It is bad. It is not good. It doesn't stand the test of time. And these are the issues we talk about. Look, if we can correct some of these issues, we need not go to IMF. It's, it's, I feel very sad. And I'm asking Keno Foreta, why would you do that? If Ghana were your company, if Ghana was your company, would you go and sign this deal? The first thing you would do is to use your internal mechanism to address the situation. And like all of us are saying, the internal mechanism is proven to be robust. So why this unnecessary contract? That, does this I mean, contract no, require parliamentary approval? Does it qualify for it, I think it doesn't because... It's not an international transaction. Yeah. If it were an international transaction, but I think that it should have reflected in their budget approval. Because we've just considered GRS estimates. And this has not found expression in GRS estimates. It hasn't also found expression in the finance minister's estimates. Because these are huge figures. And for such huge figures, you would normally come with your budget and add the footnotes. And the footnotes gives us the details as to what you want to do especially with your goods and services. So clearly there's a problem. It hasn't also found expression with NPA. So somebody quietly has signed this agreement, milking the nation, and begged for Manasseh and his team, this would have been perpetrated for a very long time. So realistically, though, what can Parliament do about this? First of all, Parliament can pass a resolution. And I think it's not too late that in considering their estimates and their appropriation, we want to see where this very amount sits, which agency is responsible for this amount. And parliament has the power to decide that we will not appropriate that money. In fact, we've just decided we are not appropriating some five billion for a certain entity, because we felt that it was not necessary given the situation that we find ourselves. We are in a serious tango with the Minister of Finance itself. They are allocating some 350 million for some very projects that we disagree with. And we're saying that allocate it to the sector ministers and ministries. We don't agree to the Ministry of Finance keeping money, sitting with the Ministry of Finance and deciding that they want to engage in infrastructure projects. That is not their job. The Ministry of Finance is not an infrastructure ministry. So you are giving us some ideas. And it's good that we continue with this engagement because one individual cannot be an oasis of all the knowledge. As we listen to you, we listen to the experts there, we pick some points. My only prayer is that both sides, we would tone down on our political affiliation and put this country first. Yeah, I mean, let, let, me, let me bring you, Kwame into that, in, into that debate again. And, and Kwame, um, you've suggested that both the OSP and Parliament, there must be some sort of a way to get this investigated. Um, you've, you've just said the, the politics. The politics always comes to play. I mean, we are entering into an election year. This is going to become a ton issue if it ever comes to Parliament. Do, do you realistically expect that anything will come out of this? 
Realistically, Evans, I think the best person for your station to interview is the Minister of Finance. Because what did he say? He said SML had saved Ghana 3 billion uh, CDs. So he knows something about it. So he's the first point of four. He's the first person you should interview for us to get a form well, on why. It, it wasn't the one who said a 3 billion. This one came from the SML themselves after they had done a tour of the place. So, so you know, and yet when they were confronted with the figures, they said, oh, they don't really think about the 3 billion. But it's on your website. <laughs> but I thought I read from the report that the minister had actually indicated some time back that we had saved uh, uh, three yeah, I mean, billion. They, 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 once it was published, I mean, everybody started repeating the line. Yeah, so where did he get that figure from? So question the minister. That figure that you talked about, was it a figure from SML? Or was it a figure from the air? Where did you get that figure from to tell us that we had saved three billion? And if it so happens that it wasn't SML, then he would tell us where that figure came from. That's the starting point. And I think Parliament should come in strongly. This is money that the people of Ghana are looking to be able to make things comfortable for them. Today, go and look Christmas. Go and see whether people will be able to celebrate Christmas the way they normally celebrate Christmas. There's no money in the system. And if we can pay these types of money, around 24 million a month to a company for being absolutely jacked, then what are we talking about? Mm. Some heads must roll. Some heads must definitely roll. And the president should make sure that this particular issue is dealt with. Okay. Um, Kwame, thank you very much. Adobe, I'm grateful. And uh, Mr. Janapo, thank you too. Uh, this is a story that we're following. Today, we heard a bit from our friends in the mining sector, the mining company themselves are, are pretty concerned about this. They've been asked to come for a meeting uh, that where they expect that they'll be given a briefing on what is going to happen with this revenue assurance uh, expansion of the contract that will now involve SML uh, monitoring what they produce to revenue assure. Pretty sure we'll hear from the petroleum chamber also in terms of its members and, and what, what this means for them. Because remember that they will be paying the 75 cents on the barrel that they produce to SML. So that's an additional levy to them in addition to every, everything else that they pay already. So there's a lot to still interrogate and find out on the subject. Enjoy the rest of your evening.